Hello, good evening. We're mighty glad to be here tonight. So um, we're ready to, uh, ready to worship God. So let's just go before in the in the prayer, Father. Father God, thank you again. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for meeting us, Lord. I just pray that through your Holy Spirit that you prepare our hearts to, to receive your message tonight, Lord. We just want to worship you, Lord. We want to give you all our strength, all our might. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, you truly are our only hope, Lord. We thank you, God, for this opportunity tonight that you've given to us, Lord, to continue, Lord, despite the situation that we're in, Lord, to continue to give your message, Lord, to your people. Father, we thank you for using us here this evening that we could continue, Lord, through the internet, Father, to get your word out to a world that is so desperate today, Lord. There is so much need, Lord. Father, as, as, as we sing, Lord, how great the chasm, Lord, that lied between us. But Father, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to bridge that gap, Lord, reconciling the sinner to his creator. And God, tonight I pray that if there's any Lord, that do not know you, that may be watching, Lord, I pray that tonight, Lord, would be the night that they would come to a personal relationship, Lord, with you and your son, Jesus Christ, accepting the free gift of salvation, Lord. 
You truly are an amazing God. We truly love you, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to bless this evening as we open up your word, Lord God, and we have this time of sweet fellowship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And welcome to our Sunday evening service here at Calvary Chapel Cornerstone. And tonight, I've had the privilege to come here and share with you uh, in place of Pastor Joe, and every time he asks me to teach, I am just blessed beyond measure to be here with you. Um, but this is really the first time that I've got to teach for him uh, via the internet, and so it's a little strange for me, but uh, it's just cool to be here with you guys. And tonight, if you have your Bibles, Turn to Isaiah 41, Isaiah 41, and if I was going to title the message anything, it would be Fear Not, and it would, I would actually even call it part two of the message that was shared this morning by our brother Ray Chavez, if you saw that message. This is kind of part two of that message, and the Lord showed us both uh, what to teach on and he shared out of the New Testament with you this morning, and tonight we're going to look at the Old Testament believers and how they had dealt with it. But, but like my brother shared earlier, you know, what an unbelievable year that 2020 has been. It seems like we have been hit with relentless wave after wave after wave, and the waves are getting bigger, they're getting closer together. It seems like we come up for air and then there's another wave. And I don't know if you can relate with me, but I, I confess to you that I wake up many mornings and I wonder, what's next? What's the next challenge? What's the next big thing? You know, I go to work and I'm, the, I'm up before the sun comes up. And sometimes at work, I'll go outside and I'll look out and it's dark and I think, Sun's going to rise here real soon. We're going to start a new day. And I wonder, God, what's, what's going to happen next? You see, the current events that we have had to endure, not just our nation, but worldwide, over the last nine months, they've had an overwhelming impact on people everywhere. Overwhelming. And without a doubt, the most painful and costly part of this is the loss of life. I think of the many who have lost family members due to the virus and the violence. You know, many of these people have died in quarantine and, and they died alone. Many people are waiting to have funerals for their loved ones. How stressful, how overwhelming. Meanwhile, while they're trying to mourn, while they're trying to cope with all of these things, the world seems to be spinning out of control around them at the same time. When they take their eyes off of the situation and they look out, it, it just gets worse for them, for many people. They're trying to cope. We're all trying to cope. Meanwhile, there's a heavy impact on our economy, the jobs that were lost, and not only the jobs that were lost, but the businesses that have, that have gone out of business and they've gone out of business, they're done, they're closed. They didn't just temporarily close, they're closed. Adults and children alike are suffering from anxiety and depression from the shutdowns and the quarantines. This is bad for us. Cases of domestic violence, child abuse is on the rise. Racial tensions on the rise like I've never seen before in my lifetime, ever. Contending with rioting, looting, burning down of businesses and cities, unprovoked violence, such hatred and anger towards our police officers. You know, I was thinking about it. We just honored our fallen fellow Americans on 9-11. We just had, uh, you know, many people had ceremonies and things that we saw. And to honor those that fell, honor those that saved lives. The New York firefighters and the New York uh, Police Department, those people that ran into those buildings to save lives, they had only one reason to run into these buildings, and it was to save lives, as many as they could. I heard stories of police officers that, that ran back in and, and to save another life, but they never made it out. 
It was every life that mattered to them. 343 firefighters and 60 police died in that event. And those officers that made it out alive after saving so many lives, they're despised today. They're despised by many who are trying to destroy our country. That's a lot to take in for most people. It's stressful. And we just heard over the weekend, right, two of our Compton uh, police officers were shot in cold blood sitting in their car while people were chanting, I hope they die. You see, and then on top of that, it's obvious that this is going to be the worst, most nastiest political campaign season that we're ever going to probably see in our lives. On top of that, we can add the millions of acres burned by the fires, properties and several lives destroyed, pushing us again back inside our houses. You know, it was interesting that we're back inside without the congregation, and that's because the, the, the smoke is over overwhelming. We can't, we can't be out there very long. But see, but we need to understand, church, here's the point. I'm not here to bum you out and just to, to tear you down, but what I want you to really understand is that we need to understand together as a church that this is a perfect environment for anxiety and fear to thrive in our lives. There's never been a more perfect environment for those things to thrive in our lives. Many are struggling like never before with fear and depression, anxiety, and this can have a severe impact on us, not just emotionally, but physically. It would have an impact on us. I remember 9-11. I remember the week after that it happened. I remember my wife and I, we would lay down and I had this terrible pain amongst my whole chest. It was, it was hard to breathe. I had pain. And, and my wife shared with me that she had the same pain, physical pain. And then I realized, you know what? It's not just my chest. It's my body. It's my, it's my fingernails. It's my hair. Every bit of me was, in, was, was suffering from the stress and anxiety. You know, the CDC reports amongst the COVID that mental health issues are on the rise and suicide amongst adults is on the rise. I want to share with you a quick story because you might fit this bill. This is a recent story out of the New York Times. It says a dentist has seen an uptick in tooth fractures amid the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Tammy, an owner of a, a dental office in Central Park in Manhattan, said, described her patient's teeth troubles to the New York Times, and she offered an explanation. She says, I've seen more tooth fractures in the last six weeks than in the previous six years. And it's not from the writing. He says, well, she addressed an increased call because their office was shut down. She had increased calls in issues like jaw pain, migraines, tooth sensitivity. And she reported that at least there was one fracture every day since they reopened in June. She says the obvious answer behind the fractures is stress related to the COVID virus. Stress. Affecting people, causing anxiety, mental health. The stress can cascade into the clenching and grinding and the damaging of our teeth. Has your jaw been hurting lately? Have you had migraines lately? I wonder if we're stressed out. And I realized, you know what, I, I kind of do. I kind of did, I kind of am clenching my teeth sometimes. When I'm driving, I'm listening, and I'm probably listening to the news, which causes me to do this. And you know, I could keep going on and on and on, but the Lord, the Lord is so good, because he's so merciful. Because in the midst of all this, as hopeless as it may seem, there's such good news in all this. There really is such good news. And that is that the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, the, the always-present God, 
He wants you to know that He loves you and He wants to encourage you. He wants to be your comfort tonight. He wants you to know that you don't need to live in fear regardless of this mess that lies before us. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and love and of sound mind. And this is what our lesson here in Isaiah 41 is all about this e evening. It's about leaning on God. It's about trusting God. Because we see here in, in uh, Isaiah 41, God's people, they lived in very scary times. It was scary. It was uncertain for them, just like it is, it is for us today. See, they were surrounded. They were surrounded by violent nations. They were in the middle of, of this, this, this trade route that went between Africa, Europe, and Asia. And it was a real busy route that many traveled on. And so this would make them vulnerable. This would make them noticeable. Who would come and overtake us? What big nation what big nation, what big bully would be the one to come in next and overtake us? See, it would be real easy for them to live in fear. They had good reason to. But you see, fearing would only overtake their lives, causing them to be unfaithful to God. After all, they experienced already the northern half of Israel. Ephraim had already been overtaken by the Assyrians. And if you've heard of the Assyrians, you know how brutal they were. It was all about brutality. That was what they did. It was their way of bringing fear and terror into anybody that would resist them. They were brutal. They liked to mutilate people. And so they had already, the northern half had already been overtaken. So how tempting must it have been for God's people, for Israel, to maybe even make allies with a pagan nation? You know, maybe, maybe if we make allies with this nation, they can protect us and we can work out a deal with them. And instead of relying upon God, we'll rely upon our neighbors. You see, they could rely on allied kings and nations and generals in armies rather than God. But see, God made it very clear, and the same goes for us tonight. While the pagan nation depended on its armies, on its idols, on its intimidation, on its power, its strength, God expected Israel to rely solely on Him. And the same goes for us today. What are we relying on like this morning right our brother ray asked the same question and so you know god must really want you to ask it because it's being asked again we have to ask ourselves during these times these stressful times who or what are we relying upon tonight are we trusting in 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 god are we truly trusting in god or are we trusting in man are we trusting in idols are we trusting in our own flesh you see, man can only do so much. We can only trust in man for so much. You know, my wife and kids, they know how much I love them. They know that I am reliable and that they can trust me. But you know what? I could only do so much for them. I could only comfort my wife to a certain extent. I could only comfort my children and my grandchildren to a certain extent. At some point, they need to rely on God. At some point, man will only take you so far. And I, and I promise you this, I would give all for my family and I would take them as far as I could possibly go till my last breath. But it ain't nowhere close to where God can take them. I believe that this November is going to be the most important election that any of us are going to ever see in our lifetime. And we have a responsibility as Christians to make our voice heard. We really do. But we got to understand that no matter who's in the White House, no matter who wins this election, we got to remember that our God is on the throne. He's never left. We have to remember that, that Jesus Christ is still King of Kings. 
We have to remember that. And shame on us. Shame on us. And, I'm, and I confess to you, I'm guilty. I worry so much about who's going to win, who's going to be. But God says, no, 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 whoa. No, slow it down. Buddy, man can only do so much for you. Our president can only do so much for us. And they'll all lie to us. The reality is that God can't lie. God won't lie. And the truth is that God wants us to depend on Him. Don't hold your breath for a vaccine. People are, oh man, October, November. Don't hold your breath. Don't hold your breath for the, the, the winner of the presidential campaign. Don't hold your breath for the economy to rebound. Don't hold your breath. Breathe. God wants us to breathe. When we're holding our breath, we're clenching our teeth, we're stressed, we're worried. We have to find our peace and comfort in God and God alone. And that's what this chapter is all about. You see, in verses 1 through 7, God invites the pagan nations and the territories surrounding to come near. Come near. God wants them to come near so that he could remind them that it's God, that is he who raises up nations of his choice to bring harsh judgment against wicked nations. And no matter how great their weapons are, no matter how well they encourage one, each other, one another, no matter what they do, no matter how courageous they are, no matter how hard they fight, they're no match for the mighty hand of God. No one is a match for the mighty hand of God. You see, they would build these, in verses 1 through 7, they had their best craftsmen building idols. They built idols and they put them together carefully and they made them as well as they could. Strong idols, countless idols, thinking that it would deliver them from their enemies. But we all know that there's no ridiculous, feeble idol that can save them from God's wrath. And in this chapter, we see there's, there's, there's two pictures. And you're one or the other tonight. There is no gray area. There's one or the other. There's those that are in verses 1 through 7 that... that that the, um, the, the, they have, their, their faith is in their idols. Their faith is in all those things. The godless of today, like the godless of then, they're no different than those people. The godless of today, they're no different than the, those of the ancient times. Why? Because they rely on everything but God. And we see that today. The best that they can do is the hope that their luck would change. Man, we're on a stroke, downstroke of bad luck. The best that they can do is they can cross their fingers. Or maybe the best that they can do is look out into the universe. Or maybe even just numb their pain by indulging in drugs, alcohol, whatever it is that would cause them to not face the reality before them. But no matter what they do, it's all in vain because they'll never find peace, the peace of God. But not so for God's people. You see, the believer, he trusts and he leans upon God. You know, the more that we trust, the less that we'll fear. But the less that we trust, the more we'll fear. How much fear are you experiencing today? Are you fearful? Look at your trust. Right? The more we trust, the less we fear. The less we trust, the more we fear. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 says that we ought to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is so important for us today. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not upon your own understanding. This is critical for the believer today. And so let's look at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 41 of Isaiah. And let's look at, as believers, let's look at what God has to say to us. As he spoke to Israel, he says, But in light of the pagan nations, in verses 1 through 7, in light of their ways of dealing with this situation, he says, but you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. He says, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called 
from its farthest regions, and I said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you, and I have not cast you away. Notice he says, but you. You see, there are those that the non-believing world that are trusting in everything but God, and they, they have their ways. He says, but you. We have a different standard, believers. He says, I have chosen you, and I have not cast you away. And just like Israel, just like those people in the ancient times, we miss the mark of God's standards too. We also make mistake after mistake. At times, we fail to obey God. We fail to love. We fail to serve Him. We fail to give to Him what is due. But most of all, I believe we fail to trust Him. Trusting in Him. You see, distrust has a terrible effect on relationships. It'll have a terrible effect on your marriage. If my wife didn't trust me, she couldn't live in peace. If I didn't trust my wife, I, I would dread going to work. You see, trust is important. If you didn't trust your kids, you would have a bunch of gray hair. But trust is important and it affects relationships. Imagine if your boss didn't trust you. You may not work there. Imagine if you didn't trust your boss. You'd live in fear of not working there. Trust is very important. But distrust in your relationship with God, it will leave you spiritually powerless and overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. Not to mention how it must grieve God. Man, it would grieve me to know that my wife didn't trust me. That would break my heart if my kid didn't trust me. I love that my kids trust me. I love that my grandkids trust me. How it must grieve our God. You know, the definition of distrust, it's such a simple word, right? We we feel like, oh, that's an easy one. We know it. You know, why would anyone even look up the definition? But it's, it's heartbreaking when it's used in the context of our relationship with God. You see, the definition of distrust, when you say it out loud, is the feeling that someone or something that cannot be relied upon. In other words, this is what we're saying to God. God, we cannot rely upon you. When we distrust him, we need to trust God. And yet, in these verses, God reminds us, I have chosen you and I have not casted you away. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Because Lord knows I deserve to be cast to the side. I deserve to not be used because I fail him so much. But our loving God is so awesome. He has so much mercy for his children it's like your child makes a mistake, right? And he has to pay the price for that mistake. But the first thing that parent wants to do is just lift that child up off his feet and, 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 and get him on his way. Why? Because we love them so much. Let's look at verses 10 through 14 of Isaiah 41. He continues on. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who are against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as of nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them, those who contend with you. Those who war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existing thing. For I, the Lord your God, will, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, for I will help you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. How many times did we see, I will help you. I will help you. Notice in verse 10, he, God begins with a commandment. He gives them a commandment. He says, fear not. Period. 
Many times I have to abruptly tell my grandkids, I have to tell them, stop. Abruptly, stop, don't do that. And they look at me and they obviously disobey because they're my grandkids and that's what grandkids do. But I'm not making, I'm not, this is not up for debate when I tell them to stop. I, when I say stop, I mean stop. And they just look at me like they don't hear me. And so God here in the same way, he's saying, fear not. But are we listening? Or do we just keep on fearing? He says, fear not. And he says, why? Because I am with you. I am with you. He says, again, do not be dismayed, discouraged, or do not be overcome. He's saying, do not do these things. Do not be overcome by fear or distress. See, this is, this is not impossible for us. Because here in these verses, in, in verse 10, we're given four promises, four uplifting reasons why that we can do what God has commanded us to do. And number one, it's because he says, why? Because number one, I am with you. I am with you. God is, is, is omnipresent. God is everywhere. In Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10, the psalmist writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. You see, God is with you. God is with you everywhere. And this fact that God is with you, it's terrifying for some, but it's great comfort for others. You see, it's terrifying for those, especially those believers who are living in sin. You got to understand, if you're living a life of sin, if you think this whole shutdown and us being away from our brothers and sisters in the Lord, if you think that you can hide your life from your church family, you're right, you can. But if you've backslidden so far, this should be terrifying to you, that God is right there. But at the same time, it should be encouraging. It's encouraging because God is reaching for you. God wants to encourage you. God wants to, like that parent lifts his children, a child up off the ground, dusts them off, and puts them back in play. And that's what God wants to do. So number one, we can go, we can live without this fear and anxiety because number one, God is with us. He lives within us. He dwells with us. And no matter where we go, we don't leave him behind. The pagans, by the way, their God, they could leave their God behind. They would have to pack up their gods and take them with them. But not our God. Our God is everywhere. Secondly, he says, first, I am with you. Secondly, he says, I will strengthen you. I will strengthen you. God is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. In Psalm 28, verses 7 through 8, the, Lord said, the psalmist writes, The Lord is my strength and my shield. I will trust him with all my heart. He helps me, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out into songs of thanksgiving. The Lord gives his people strength. He is a safe fortress for his anointed king. So secondly, he will strengthen you. When we're weak, he is strong. We need to look to him for strength. He is our strength and our shield. And I love it. He says that he helps me and my heart fills with joy. Not fear, joy. Thirdly, he says here in these two verses, I will help you. You see, our God is our constant help in time of need. In Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3, it says that God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help us in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the water sur surge. 
You see, this is a picture of those things going on around us. Let the earthquakes come. Let the mountains crumble. This is disaster. You know, uh, we could say, let, let, the, let the people go crazy. Let the, let the mountains burn. Let whoever you want be president. Let all these things, let the troubled waters rise. He says, but have no fear. Have no fear. It's God. It's God. It's not man. It's not anything that we can do. He will help you. So he will strengthen us. He will help us. And he will uphold you. It says the fourth promise, he will hold, uphold you with his righteous right hand. So God says, I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And lastly, here in, the, in these verses, he says that I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You ever shake hands with anybody famous? You know, somebody who's like, you know. I mean, I've seen people like, I got to shake the president's hand. You know, or I got to shake this football player's hand, and it was like, whoa. It's just so awesome. But imagine God's mighty, <laughs> his righteous, mighty right hand. That very hand in Isaiah 48, 13 says that it was God speaking. He says, it was my hand that laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand that spread out the heavens above. And when I call out the stars, they all appear in order. That right hand wants to uphold you. That's the right hand that upholds me. You see, we have that confidence that it's God that will uphold me. Are you, are you crawling through life right now? Are you, are you in a crawl? Have you been beaten down so bad that you're in a crawl? Let God's righteous right hand uphold you. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Oh, sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. He created the heavens and the earth with his strong, powerful arm. The same arm that he's reaching out tonight to pick you up off the floor. You might be on the floor tonight. You might be overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. You might be so beat up by the world. You might just be ready to, to, to just let go. And lose it. But God says, no, 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 no. I will, I will, I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. And I will uphold you. We don't need any more than that. Verses 11 through 12. He goes on to say and give a wonderful promise that is, is for us, right? That we're going to inherit this promise. He says in 41 verses uh, 11 and 12, he says, Behold, all those who are incensed against you, that word could be translated raged. So all of those who rage against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive shall perish, who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing as a non-existing thing. What a great promise from God. Isaiah reminds me of Isaiah 54, 17. It says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, saith the Lord. This is the heritage of the servant. Are you a servant of the Lord tonight? If you're a servant of the Lord tonight, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. God's right hand will hold you up. He will strengthen you. He will encourage you. Those that seek to destroy you, what does it say? They shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. You know, this reminds me of that. Remember when Jesus, when they brought the woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus? Remember when they brought her to him and they said, hey, you know, she should be stoned, right? And when she was on the floor, as Jesus called out those that were coming against her, as they left one by one, because Jesus basically puts them to shame, 
says, you know, you without fear throw the first stone, uh, without sin throw the first stone. And when that woman looked up, Jesus asked her, where are your accusers? See, she was near death. She was facing death. She stood there probably petrified, knowing that they were going to stone her. A horrible death. But as Jesus advocated, when she looked up, so where are your accusers? She said, there are none. This is what this reminds me of. He said, those that war against you shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. No weapons formed against you shall prosper. It's comforting to know that we inherit these promises from God. You see, because no matter what political group to, decides to do something ridiculous, whether they get out there and they try to burn Bibles in the street, whether there's a governor or a government that tries to shut down the church, whatever it may be, a family, a co-worker, that slanders you because you're a child of God, they will be ashamed and they will be disgraced, God says. Those people burning the Bibles, those people fighting against the church, they will be disgraced. Those who war against us, the Bible says here that they will become as of nothing, as of non-existent. No one triumphs against the mighty hand of God who comes against him. Our governor may not want our church to happen. That he may fight against our church, right, for some reason. But you know what? He's going to come and go, and the word of God's going to last. The word of God will stay forever. Can anyone name the governor from... 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Can you name them? I can't. They're long forgotten. But I know I remember the Word of God, right? The Word of God lives in my heart. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Now it says, now, in Isaiah 41, 13, 14, it says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. What a beautiful picture, again, of God here reaching out to hold our hand and comfort us. In verse 13, he says, he says I will hold your right hand. You know, when my, when my children were young, when we would cross the street or when we would walk through a parking lot, you know, I would put my hand out. And they knew the drill. The minute I put my hand out, they would grab a hold of my hand. And then we would proceed. They knew that they were safe when they had a, grabbed a hold of my hand. You see, I would just simply put it out. And they knew the drill. They knew what to do. They would grab on. But there came a time in my children's life where I didn't have to do that anymore. It might look funny if I had to hold my son's hand or my daughter's hand today and cross the street with them. It might look a little ridiculous, right? Because I don't need to do that anymore. However, my kids know, my kids understand that even though I don't hold their hand anymore to cross the street, but one thing that my kids know is that my hand is still there. My hand is still there. And it doesn't matter how old they get. Right? Parents, you guys understand this. No matter how old they get, you always have your hand out to help them, to reach for them. How much more can we count on our Father in heaven? His righteous right hand reaching out for you and I. It would be painful if I reached out and my child said, no thanks. No thanks. It's great to know that God's mighty, powerful, righteous right hand is here to help us. It's here to strengthen us. It's here to uphold us today. It's a wonderful promise that God gives us. And for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their 
personal Lord and Savior, those spoken of here in verses in the previous verses, 1 through 7, those that depend on a stroke of good luck, those that depend on the universe or idols or their own strength, God is constantly reaching out to you too. He doesn't only reach out to His own children. He's reaching out to you too. But you see the difference? When God reaches out to us believers, it is to comfort us, to strengthen us, to uplift us, and all those things. But not so for the non-believer. God reaches His hand out because He wants to offer you the greatest need that you have in your life, and it's salvation. Not comfort and peace. If you don't know Jesus Christ, He's not holding His hand out to make you comfortable in life. He's reaching out to you tonight because He wants to have a personal relationship with you. In fact, God allows trials in both lives of the believer and non-believer, but they're for two different purposes. The purpose of trials in the believer's life is that He can grow, that He could trust God, that His faith can grow. And through trials and tribulation, we produce, it produces perseverance and we grow, we mature in the Lord. But the trials in the unbeliever's life is to bring him to humility, to bring him to his knees before God so that he would say, God, I know I need you. To the believer, to the Christian tonight, I'll close with this, to the Christian Simply just trusting God in the times that we're living. Take His hand as He offers it to you. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things, even, even fires, even riots, shootings, violence, all things. Is that possible? Is it possible that all things could work together for good to those who love and who are called according to His purpose? Are you called according to His purpose? Do you love God? Then yes, all things. But to the non-believer, to the non-Christian, non the question for you is this. The question for you is simply, how much longer are you willing to go? How much longer are you willing to go without the loving, comforting arms of God? How much longer? How long will you walk without allowing God to hold your hand? How long will you bump and trip and fall and slip and get, in, get back up on your own and, and refuse the, the, the mighty right hand of God? In Philippians four, uh, chapter 4, verses 67, it says, I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You see, trust Him. And then you will experience the peace of God. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ in order to experience the peace of God. But more importantly, more importantly, how long will you gamble with your eternity? You see, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed another minute of life. How long will you wait to call on Jesus Christ? You see, the Bible says He's the only way. And in 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus Himself said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. In Proverbs 14, verse 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see, this is why Jesus left His throne in heaven. 
He came to us. He put on flesh. He lived amongst His people. And He paid the ultimate price for you and me. The Bible says that Jesus paid a price for all humanity's sin and that all of those who received Him into their heart will be saved. But those who reject Him now, the Bible says that God will reject them when they stand before Him. The Bible also says in Hebrews 9, 27, that it is appointed for man once to die and then the judgment. In the book of Matthew, the Bible tells us there are two kinds of people on judgment day. When you stand before God, there are two kinds of people. There will be those that hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And there will be those that hear the dreadful, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's one or the other. And tonight, where do you stand at this moment with Jesus Christ? When you stand before God, do you know Jesus? Will Jesus say, I know him, he's mine? Or do you just know about Jesus? See, knowing about Jesus isn't enough. It's knowing him with a personal relationship. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Eternity apart from him. He says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made in salvation. And so... If you find yourself tonight struggling with fear, anxiety, unbelief, and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, I want to offer you now an opportunity to receive him, to accept him into your heart. And if you want to receive Jesus Christ into your heart, I'm going to say a prayer and you guys just Repeat this prayer after me. It's just asking God to come into your life. It's asking God to come into your heart and change you. So wherever you may be, it doesn't matter where you're at. You could be driving, you could be laying down, you could be standing up, standing on your head. It doesn't matter where you're at. God wants to hear from you. His righteous right hand is reaching out for you. And so if you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, just repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I come before you to ask you, God, to save me. Save me from my sin, Lord. Come into my heart and make me a new person. I ask that you would lead me, that you would guide me, and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I give you my heart, I give you my life, and I ask you to lead and guide me for the rest of the way, Lord, until I stand before you, God. Lord, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. I trust in you with my eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. If you said that prayer, reach out to us. Reach out to our email. I believe that we posted up the email on the screen and the, or text us by phone number. Um, However it is, get a hold of us. Because it's important that, that you have discipleship. You know, we don't want you to just ask Christ into your heart and just leave you alone. Uh, we want to help you. We want to give you some resources to help you grow. We want to give you a Bible. And, but most importantly, find a good Bible teaching church that you can get into and um, that you could attend regularly. So I'll close in prayer. Thank you guys so much for for having me, and it was just a blessing, and I pray that you would be encouraged. Think about the, the mighty, righteous right hand of God, and, and, you know, we don't have to worry anymore. We don't have to live in fear. Well, let's pray. Father, we do ask you, God, to strengthen your people, Lord, encourage your people. Father, be with them, strengthen them, uphold them, Lord, encourage them, and that, Father, if there's anybody out there right now, God, who is just 
struggling with anxiety, with fear, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, I lift them up to you, God. I pray that your, your Holy Spirit would touch them, Lord. Father, show them, Lord, how real you are, God, how powerful you are, how amazing you are, Lord. Uh, Lord, that you are the great physician, God. Heal us, Lord. God, we ask that you heal our nation. Lord, we pray for those two police officers, Lord, that are in critical condition tonight, Lord, their families. God, I pray for them. I would lift them up to you, Lord. And God, for the firefighters and all that's been lost, Lord, all that's been destroyed through these fires, Lord. Father, you definitely have my attention, God. And Lord, I pray that, you, that the rest of the nation, Lord, that you would get their attention, Lord. And, and Father, I know, Lord, that you've gotten the attention of many of us, Lord. So Father, we ask you to heal our land, Lord God. Father, that we would lay down our idols, Father, and just turn to you. Trust in you and you only, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.